This episode, Father Son Spearing, a generational Spiro culture. I've got Glenn and Bo George and Andrew and Corbin Hart, two father son duos. And uh, I get to chat with these guys while I was staying over in WA preparing for the Nationals. These guys are very, very cool, very, very down to earth. And uh, all of them really good blokes just to hang out with and spend time in the water with. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We're going to get there in just just two shakes of a lamb's tail. Uh, I did want to just have a quick mention. Uh, Noob Spear is on the lookout for some social media interns. If you're looking at getting some experience in the realm of social media, we've got some unpaid internships just to help us basically run the Instagram and Facebook. And uh, we've got some scheduling tools and stuff. There will be some training provided. Uh, and I'm always happy to provide references. If you are interested in it, if that's the realm that you're headed into, uh, hit me up. Just give me an email, shrek at noobspero.com, and uh, we can get online and have a quick chat. Uh, also, if you go to noobspero.com and head up into the menu there, there is a section called Nooba Stories. It's a place where you can leave a voice message, and I would love to hear if you I haven't had a Nooba story for ages. So go up into the menu, give back at noobspero.com, Hit Nuba Stories, you can hit record and record a voice message up to three minutes. If you've got a new bit of equipment that you're using, if there was an episode that you found particularly frothworthy, maybe something actionable has emerged into your spearfishing as a result of it, I would love to hear about that. Even a scary story, lesson learned, whatever you like. Again, go to noobspero.com, head up into the menu, give back, hit Nuba Stories and leave me a voice message. Let's get into it. It's a generational spearing with two father-son duos. I had a heck of fun bringing this one to you. Here we go. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you in partnership with Adreno. Live it, breathe it with the world's largest dive store. Huge range of equipment, always growing, always changing. They are the world's largest dive store. They are available just about everywhere. They have hassle-free returns, massive range of equipment, price match guarantee, and you can check them out online. You can even use the code Noob Spiro to save $20 on every purchase over 200 at adreno.com.au. Check them out. Boom. Are you US based? Looking for free diving, spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website, so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends and uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. I love companies and people that challenge and poke fun at political correctness. Fuck the Tax Man does exactly that with gear that we can identify with. The frustration of being taxed. Go to fuckthetaxman.com to check out a huge range of UV resistant sun safe shirts, hoodies, shirts, stickers and more that celebrate the spearfishing life. Recently I really, really like the look of some of the boat wraps and boat decals. Go to fuckthetaxman.com, check out what they've got. Use the code NoobSpear at fuckthetaxman.com and get a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more. Check it out at fuckthetaxman.com. G'day legends, welcome back to another another Noob Spiro podcast. We've got I'm surrounded by two father and son duos. We're here at the WA Spearfishing Nationals. Um, two very talented young men coming through the ranks and their dads are sort of partnering up with them in the water. But um, introduce yourselves, guys. We'll just go around the room and um, maybe your name, your age, where you're from and how long you've been spearing. G'day, my name's Corbin. I'm 16. I've been spearing for seven years. Nice. I'm Corbin's dad, uh, Andrew. Uh, I've been spearing for a long time, but I did have a big break in between. So I did spear as a kid. Um, and then uh, when Corbin um, sort of got to the age of spearing, uh, I started back up. And so the last seven years have been a very different spearing experience for me. Cool. Awesome, Andrew. Um, I'm Bo. I've been spearing probably... 10 years now, would it be? Yep. And from coughs. How old are you, bro? I'm 16. 10 years, so you started when you were six. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm I'm Glenn George, Bo's dad. Uh, I probably started when I was about six or seven, so that's pushing 50 years I've been spearing now. Uh, grew up in coughs, so most a lot of it out of there. Mm. 
Glenn, keep the mic there for a sec. Um, let's talk about uh, a family legacy of Spearin and why it's important to you and what, what it's like coming over to this comp. Well, the, the famous family legacy goes back, I guess, all the way back to my, my father and his two brothers who grew up in Masterton in New Zealand. Mm. And uh, they grew up on a farm and used to just to head down the local creek and they, um, they visited the local disposal store back in the day and made their own masks and made their own, had their woolen jumpers for wetsuits and used to play around. And ultimately, um, Russell, my, my uncle, who's still in New Zealand, he actually won the New Zealand titles, uh, oh, right. spearfishing championships a couple of times. Uh, him and dad paired up and won it once. Um, so, and they obviously got us into it, my brother and myself and my cousins uh, and through to the boys now and it was a no-brainer. It was always going to happen. Sick. So the Nationals coming over here with the comp, bringing Bo over, um, that's, a, that's a big undertaking from Coffs Harbour to Dunsborough, Western Australia. Um, it's not a light thing that you guys have done. Speak to the motivation for that if you can. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a big effort. But again, you know, I think with, with Bo, he's so keen it was always going to happen. I've been diving, like I said, forever, but I've only ever dived one other nationals mm. um, for no other reason that I've just never, I've, you know, I, I don't mind the comps. I'll take it or leave it a little bit. But when there was an opportunity to dive father-son in the pairs now, mm. well, I'm in. Yeah, nice. All right, let's go to Bo. Um, Bo, we've had day one. We're sort of on our rest day after day one, just for everyone so that they're sort of familiar. It's a, a three-day comp affair. Explain to people how the comp works if you can in terms of like the species list and some of the maybe the general, the, how the comp generally works. Can you explain that? Yeah, sure. So there's three separate days. Each day there's a different location that's chosen across the – coast down south western australia and all the pairs swim off of the shore and just swim around wherever they want to for six hours and went shoot as many fish as they can really off the species list which is provided and so for the point scoring there's a hundred points per species and an extra 10 points per kilo the species is each different species has different minimum sizes obviously they have to be the um, the fisheries minimum size originally, plus the minimum size for the comp. Yeah, nice. And if they're not for the minimum size for the comp, then you get penalised or mm. s- some of the different rules get you disqualified. So, mm. um, Day one, did a bit of a good swim? Yeah, went probably over 7Ks <laughs> swim. <laughs> your dad said you'd never swum that far before in your yeah. life. Talk yeah. to me about, uh, was it tiring? Did you, how, how did you find it? Yeah, it was very tiring, but we took our time mostly. We swam pretty hard to the first spot, but then just cruised around for the rest of it. Mainly. Nice. And mowed it back by the sounds of it. Yeah. We are yeah. about two and a half Ks out probably, or two. With an hour to go. Yeah, two, two and a half Ks out with an hour to go. So it was a good solid swim home. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, the Viz was a bit crap inshore, wasn't it? Yeah. But out wider, did you find a bit of good viz? Yeah, it was probably th- maybe two or three metre viz in, like right in shore. Mm. And when you got out to where we ended up, it would have opened up to 15 metres. So Nice. Yeah, it went pretty good. What was your best fish of day one? That's a good question. Um, what did I shoot? Probably the break sea cod. Yeah, nice. First yeah. one? Yeah. 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 How did you know it was a break sea? Oh, I've just seen them on the species list. And, and you were able to it. Yeah, well, know what it was? Pretty well. The picture that I saw on um, the species list that Tom made up for us, it yeah. looked, when I went down there, I, I saw it and it looked exactly like that picture. So. Sick. Yeah. All, all good. Let's go to Corbin then because Corbin's had day one with his dad as well in the water. Um, Corbin, talk to me about how far into the comp until you shot your first fish yesterday. So... When we got out, first bit of swim, about an hour in, I shot a banded sea sweep and on the species list, just getting get your gun eye guard in. in. Yeah. yeah. I blew its head off. It was a bit powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so, was that with a pranger on or yeah, something? Yeah, that was a pranger. Oh, yeah. nice. And then about 20 minutes later, yeah. I shot a foxy with the pranger. 
Okay, cool. And the pranger broke. Oh. Yeah, so that was a fun day without a pranger. Yeah, yeah. Lots of the species seem to want a pranger, eh? Yeah. Um, when you looked at the species list, did you think, okay, these are the species that I'm going to use a pranger for and these are the ones I'll probably just use a, a normal flopper shaft for? So obviously all the really small like slender fish like snook and whiting, they really demand a pranger. So mm. it was really hard trying to shoot one with a straight spear. Yeah. It, yeah. A lot of the fish are doable with a straight spear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And you've had a little bit of experience in comps. So for you, was it? were you nervous at the start of the day yesterday? Not really nervous. Uh, I was for the sub juniors two years back now. Yeah. But this one was just like I was going to take it slow and chill and just see what it's like. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's good when you can just be relaxed and just kind of enjoy your spearing, eh? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the junior category, talk to me if you can about – what you think we need to do to get more juniors in? Have you got any ideas? I reckon if the comps were more spaced around holidays, I know that's hard because I know the WA holidays are already over. So yeah. kids in WA are already back to school. I've heard a lot of the people say their kids couldn't go because they had to do school. Yeah. So I think better planning for time-wise. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't cool. even think about that, to be honest, until you just said it. And now it's self-evident. I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, yeah, right. What about like your your guys club in Coffs Harbour? It's pretty awesome for juniors, isn't it? Yeah. You yeah. got really like stand up mentors and people that they're happy to show you the ropes. Yeah. Who are the, some of the people that have been influential helping you? It would have been Tom Sandstrom when I met him at the boat ramp when I was going spearing with my dad. We yeah. were not very good at the time. Yeah. So when he came up to us at the boat ramp. Okay. And then new Bo and Glenn. Okay. Yeah. And that's just brought me into the club. Okay, sick. So yeah. you had a mate in there and then you met a nice guy at the ramp. Yeah. And inside the club, um, how much involvement? Do you guys have like any training that you go to? Like are there like nights where you learn stuff and things like that? Or Yeah, we have Tuesday nights dive training. Okay. Yeah. Is it a swimming pool local? Yeah, local swimming pool at Mooney Beach. Okay, cool. Some people will say, oh, clubs are expensive and, you know, it's difficult to get to. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, how many juniors have you guys got in the club there as well? Uh, so we have three semi-consistent people who go to training, Bo, Connor, and I. Okay. And then we have heaps which turn up now and then. I know heaps who are in the club and don't go to training. Okay. But we have a few juniors. That. Yeah. So you're doing pool training. We might come back to that. Um, and I want to talk to you about how worthwhile you think it is. And we might go to your dad for a sec. Andrew, for you, the logistics of bringing the family over to WA, it's not an easy feat. Um, but why do you place such a value on bringing the boys over here and getting them involved in, in, in this sort of stuff? Yeah, well, I think um, I think most families uh, orientate around sports. Um, and for our family, uh, Corbin's selected sport is spearfishing, which is fantastic for me because you know, <laughs> I, I, get, <laughs> I get to uh, really participate in it. Yeah. Um, but so, so I don't really think that's a, it's an un uncommon thing. The gear that we need for spearfishing makes it very uh, complex and mm. difficult to get it to get it around and get it to where we need it. But um, realistically, you know, travel interstate, we've done it a few times now. Um, the whole make a family holiday of it. Yeah. Uh, so so Great idea. Uh, it did work out with the New South Wales school holidays. It is hard when the holidays are on different um, different weeks. And so you look, look, we actually came across and spent. Um, the first week of the trip at Rottnest Island, which was fantastic family experience. Mm. And um, we got to you know, view some of the local species and, and get our eye in and and then come down for the competition. It's a different state, isn't it? Like it's just such a it's yeah. just such a big area for a start. And like the temperature range from north to south, is like, they've got everything over here and they've got a lot, a lot of endemic species that are pretty cool, I reckon. Oh yeah, it's amazing how different it is, um, and the water clarity uh, mm. is is incredible. It has, certainly has been the whole time we've been here. I think yesterday was probably the murkiest day, and even that went went to about fifteen meters out wide. Yeah, so yeah. still pretty good. Um, when we got in the morning and it was dark, and there's all that rotten seaweed, and it was like two meters. I was like, "Is this what it's going to be like for the rest of the day?" I was so glad when we got out beyond it. You yeah, guys probably felt the same. Yeah, absolutely. And the other the other unique thing I think over here is the geology, um, and it seems to have been from Perth all the way down to here is that limestone background. So 
Uh, they've got some different different geology around, but that limestone that erodes away and creates those undersea cave environment, mm. uh, that's phenomenal diving. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I know off, um, off Rottnest the kids were finding swim-throughs everywhere that, uh, and, uh, you know, the light streaking down through all the different holes. It's, yeah. it's hard to describe, but yeah. um, it really is amazing. Yeah. And it's cool seeing all the kelp too. Like, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Some people just froth on, you know, super clean, tropical type spearing. I guess with coughs, you guys have kind of got the best of both worlds there. And do you feel like this part of the coast has got, well, maybe not as far south as we are, but Rottnest, do you feel like it was sort of similar type area in terms of, you know, where it sits in, the, in that sort of temperature band? Not not really. Uh, coughs, we don't, uh, we have to battle to get clear water. It's not... Um, it's not it's not a regular occurrence, although it does it does happen. Mm. I think we're in uh, we we get both the warmer and colder climates in coughs, so yep. we sort of get where they meet. And our water temperature at the moment, when we left, was you know twenty seven, twenty eight, maybe down to twenty six. Mm. We've come across and we're sort of in that twenty, twenty one, twenty two range. Mm. So um, maybe it's more like coughs at, at in the middle of winter time. Okay, at the moment. Um, and I haven't really seen any of those um, warm water, like I haven't seen any mackerel out at Rottnest or any of those warm water. So the, you know, what are we sort of seeing? The um, Sambos. Sambos Sambos everywhere, yeah. Um, seen some, seem to be a lot more snapper or the more visible snapper. They seem to be less scared over here. Yeah, um, I'd agree. And um, obviously the, the guys found some yellowtail kingfish, so that would be a common species to coughs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, let's go back to Corbin just for a sec. Corbin, um, how many days in the water have you had on this family holiday so far? I have been in the water for all but three days, only two days. So, okay. Fish of the trip so far? Probably the dewy from yesterday. Okay. Didn't get to weigh it in because it was under the comp limit. Yeah, which Still, is 50 stay. centimetres, but... Um, there's no size limit on them in in the fisheries, but for the comp, it's a 50 centimeter minimum. How 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 big do you think it would have gone? Would have been 35 plus. Oh right yeah. There. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. De- oh, we're gonna eat that fish for dinner tonight, aren't yeah. we? All right, fish burgers for dinner. That's gonna be good. Do you like cooking? Love cooking. What yeah. are you doing with seafood these days? So for lobster, I've got the crayfish popcorn from yeah. the 99 oh, Spear nice. recipes book. Yeah, that's Sven's recipe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. And that's just marinating it and then chucking it in some corn flour, deep frying that. Yeah, shallow frying, and that's awesome. Cupy mayo. Yeah. And then for we tried the trout bombs. Okay. With heaps of resources, that's really good. Okay. And then there's I used to work at a fisherman's co-op, so yeah. I've stolen that batter recipe. Okay. So chuck that on every now and then. What does that look like? So that's um flour, corn flour, water, or beer. And then mix that together, leave it in the fridge for a while, and then chuck it in onto the, some fish, deep oh. fry it. Yeah. Nice. Sounds like you like cooking as nearly as much as you like sparing. That's good. It's a good. It's a good way to stay passionate about it. I think is eating what you catch. So that's cool. Um, for the next couple of comp days for you, um, what what are you going to do differently than you did on day one? It was mentioned to us by the organizer of the comp that we should be staying in the spots a bit more. We were, Dad and I were flying over the spots a little bit too fast, I reckon. Yeah. We stayed in one spot and we saw a blue moe and we shot the fox fish there, saw plenty of stuff. So there was a lot of ground where it wasn't real productive. So do you mean like you're going to swim and then when you find a fishy area, you're going to hang out a little bit longer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if there's signs of life, it's probably worth a check. Yeah. And what kinds of species do you think you might get more opportunities on by doing that? I think more of the species which hang out in rocks, like harlequin. Okay. And there wasn't any red scorpion fish shot yesterday. Okay. So maybe some of them. All right, cool. Weera, yeah. Um, in terms of putting it on your score sheet, what fish would you most like to put on there in the next couple of days, given the right opportunity? Probably a big dewy. Yeah? Yeah, or a samba. Big dewy or a samba. Did you guys see that big Samson fish yesterday in the shallows? Dad took a um, shot at it. I had my one prong left on the pranger. Give him, give him the mic. One prong left on the pranger. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because Corbin, um, which after we lost one gun, sort of just supporting Corbin on the main line. 
Yeah. But you could have done a lot of spearing just on the four metre line because it was yeah. very shallow, um, obviously keeping one person at the top of the water. But um, literally after the, I think it was the second shot uh, Corbin had with the pranger, we only had one prong left. <laughs> and um, I had that Samson fish, we were, that was right near the exit where we pull out, um, get out of the water. And um, it was there right next to me. I thought I'd, I'd try. Yeah. Have you guys <laughs> eaten any Sambo since you've been here? Have Not you? since we've been here, no. I no. hear like it's really good eating. Um, I hear it's one of the better eating out of the, like Kingy, Amberjack and sort of that family. Yeah, I, it seems, I think I've heard both things. I've heard people don't really prefer the Samson fish over here, which seems odd. Yeah, uh, people will do the same with Kingy over here yeah. as well, though. I still like it. If you, well, guys if like you don't, if you don't get it, we do. Oh, uh, my wife Tanya loves uh, kingfish, but um, we do occasionally get the mushy ones. So the yeah, you know. I've had one from your way. I think it was the first one I, I ever had that was mushy. It was yeah. a Pop Sabre one. Yeah, I was like, "What are you guys doing to the bloody kingies down there? It, it does seem to be pretty rare, though. It's not um, yeah, most of them. The majority of them are fine. Mm. Yeah. yeah, cool. Oh, good. Let's come back over to Bo. Um, Bo, same question I asked Corbin. Um, in the next sort of two days of comp, what are you going to do differently than you did on day one? Um, well, there's the next two spots have quite different ground to what we had at um, at Augusta. Mm. So probably be a lot more cave diving because we didn't. Dad and I didn't find as many sort of big cave areas yesterday. But um, same thing as Corbin as well. Maybe hanging around the fairly fishy areas a bit longer, seeing if some of the fish come out. Yeah, cool. In terms of being a non-local and coming over to the other side of Australia, we get sent the the locations or the prospective locations in advance without getting in the water and scouting and, and without maybe too much local knowledge. How do you work out a strategy for where you guys are going to swim? Do you and your dad negotiate that or do you discuss that? What does that look like? Yeah, well, Dad, before we went to, before we go to each spot, Dad's had a look on Navionics and looked at all of the sort of the depth and the structure that they can have around the areas and works out where we want to swim mostly. And um, so we ended up heading, because all of the, yesterday, all of the stuff in right, right in close was super shallow and there wasn't many fish in the area. So we pretty well headed straight for the bigger rocky island areas mm. and went around the back of those because the current was pushing into them as well. So, yeah, went on the front of those. And that worked well for you? Yeah, it went pretty well. I saw, some, I saw a pretty good snapper pretty early on at the first spot we stopped at. So, yeah, there was a few fish around. That feels good, doesn't it, on a comp day when you're seeing good fish? Yeah, It gives sure. you a bit of confidence. Yeah, I think Derek and I swam for like at least a kilometre and a half before we started seeing anything decent. So why well, we got getting late as well. It's nice when you're – were you guys there on time? Everything was good? Was it a pretty easy um, get in yesterday? Was it, was it? Were you anxious? Yeah, it was, wasn't too difficult. I was just struggling to put my wetsuit on because it was wet um, from when I hosed it out the day before <laughs> and it was really cold that morning. So it took yeah. me a while to – Bring myself to put it on. No wonder you swam so well. You were trying to warm up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, good. We might go to your dad for a sec. Walk me through some memorable um, moments, if you can, um, getting Bo in the water and and uh, maybe his first few fish. How did you get him to catch the bug? Obviously, it wasn't all you. It was Bo himself. But as a dad, how can you kind of be strategic and 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 get them to get the bug that we have? Yeah, you have to... Well, I had, I've got two boys and they both spear and so I was working, working them together, which, <laughs> which helps. Um, and I guess you've got to start out careful. Spearing's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a heavy-duty sport when you're mm. really in, out there. It's, it's not simple. It's not easy. Um, there's some risk involved. So you start out small. But we, from, from the get-go, I had them largely out in the boat and we had a particular little go-to spot and there's there's a there's one particular location where the the red moeys got quite a touch up for a few years <laughs> um and you just got to pick your days you know um and 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 be wary that they don't be put off by 
taking them out in really two meter seas and nasty stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and we had a bit of that, and, and you've got to also have that's that comes with it, right? Mm. So you just you do what you do, but I tried to pick the days um, and just take it little bit by little bit. But they it was pretty easy. I mean, it's a great sport, isn't it? 100%. They, they caught the bug pretty quick. Yeah, you showed me a photo earlier. I'll probably link it up in the show notes today. Um, we might call. I don't know what I'm going to call this episode yet, but it might be um, the coughs lads or something. Yeah, so noobspirit.com forward slash coughs lads. I'll link up some of the photos of um, of these these fellas in the spearing, but you showed me an image of um, the dolphin fish. I think was that you? Yeah. So that was that was a really good starting point too. Like dolphin fish are, are great for the kids. You obviously again it's a fair, fair way offshore, so you're taking your I don't know how boat you're probably six or seven, um, and we had them out offshore in you know 70, 80 meters of water. But obviously dolphin fish are, are um, the surface fish, so those boys started out, that was a bit of bread and butter as well. And it gives them the bug. Like you, yeah. you can get out to those traps and you could you could nail a two, three, four, ten kilo fish just like that. So mm. they loved it. Did you guys have any scary moments? Did you have any scary moments with the boys in the water? I have scary moments with the boys all the time. <laughs> They're your boys and so, you know, we were, I don't I don't tell them much of this because yeah. what I'm watching I, I could think of three days ago we were up we were up at or four or five days ago we're up at Geraldton and and uh, and Bo now obviously is really capable but you're still you're a father and and I've I've watched him swim down into a cave yeah and uh, with a real gun we mentioned caves before that the structure up there is amazing and mm. you know house size stuff. And Bo just disappeared in there. And here I am bobbing around on the surface watching, waiting, waiting, waiting and 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40, I don't know how long it was, but he was in there. And it, look, he came out with a dewy, good on him. But, yeah. you know, even that stuff, you you worry about it. And um, I've had plenty of moments over the years. I'm really cautious with reels versus rigs and floats. Mm-hmm. And I pick my moments and a lot of people uh, there's a real bit of a, f- not a fad, but a lot of people prefer reels these days for good reasons. Yeah. But they're not as safe um, and you can disappear pretty fast. And I've had plenty of moments where these one of these boys, especially Riley, my eldest, who tends to love to sort of bob off on his own, where the hell is he, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. But there is an argument in WA and some of the locals have put it to me before that they start on real guns here because of the nature of the structure. And like when you're out in a float line and you've got swell or surge and you go into a cave, your float line wraps around everything and arguably it can put you in more awkward positions than if you're just with a real gun. But I don't like new guys starting with a real gun because – you don't have the common sense to let go of your spear gun because, the, the, you know, we know the, the nature of taking a real gun is sometimes you're saying goodbye to it because if, 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 if it, you get a muzzle wrap or, you know, your reel jams up, goodbye, $800 spear gun, and most people just try to hang on, I think. Well, look. Yeah. Okay. So this is, it's right on point. So um, Tom was instrumental in getting um, Corbin uh, hooked onto the sport. But, um, yeah, we're out. Uh, was it probably the first dolphin fish hunting experience? Mm. And um, uh, Corbin um, lined up a seven kilo model and 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 plugged it, and um, did not let go of the gun. So he was on a line and a float. <laughs> but you quickly learn. Uh, you know, he's only a small kid. I'd say he's probably age ten. And you quickly work out just how powerful uh, it, you know, even a seven kilo fish is, and starts dragging him underwater. So. Um, before we let go, everyone's screaming for him to let go. I don't know whether he heard us, but um, yeah, really interesting experience. So definitely line and float um, for the kids. Yeah. There's a bit of target fixation as well, isn't there, Corbin, when you shoot a fish? Um, walk me through what your dad just said for you in that moment. Can you remember it? I can barely remember that moment. I can definitely remember getting dragged. I can't really remember getting pulling the trigger. I can... Definitely remember getting it on the boat though. That was awesome. was was that one of those moments where you think that you were excited and having fun, and your dad was the one panicking? Yes. 
That was a lot. There's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because sometimes when you start to, you're not quite aware of maybe the the risk of what's going on. Whereas your dad, he, you know, they've been around long enough that they kind of know exactly what can happen. Yeah, yeah. But they, those moments are also pretty frothy, eh? Yeah, it's always those moments that you really remember. Yeah, like that was six years ago. That was when I started. Yeah, I can still remember that. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. What about recently? Have you had any of those moments where you've scared the crap out of your dad? Oh, yeah. or Okay, so, uh, one. We were cray diving on Rottnest the other day. Yeah. I've gone into a cave after a cray and I've gone to grab one and it just disappeared somehow. So I've grabbed the cray loop, gone to the back of the cave, looped a cray and then gone out the other exit. Dad oh. did not see me go out the other exit. So he's gone into the cave while I've gone up to the surface looking for me. Vanished. I've <laughs> oh, disappeared. Oh, well. wow. Yeah. So I get to the surface and he's gone out all scared and my brother's just giving him the thumbs up. (laughs) (laughs) You guys are going to realize when you get older, but it's pretty cool that your parents invest so much in you guys coming to do this thing because we, the longer you do it, the more aware of the risks you become. So to let your kids do it, who are the most precious thing in the world to you, is, is like testament to like them wanting to just see you guys thrive as adults. So I reckon it's really cool. Yeah. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say, Crikey, mate. Or say Shrek from the Noob Spiro sent you and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiro's know and trust. I know because one works there and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian made hydration products tailored for Spiro's and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. To make the most of your spearfishing trip, charter or competition, I am putting together a 50-day spear-ready program so that I can be in the best condition to make the most of this WA comp. It's a big swim comp, shore-based, and big swims for the day. I am not carrying a hell of a lot of physical conditioning because just due to my life and lifestyle, pretty busy with four kids. So this program will be 100% focused on action. And I thought since I'm doing it, why not take a whole bunch of other people along for the ride? It's a 50-day program incorporating strength and conditioning, nutrition, dry and pull training, and everything else with a bunch of experts. I reached out to a whole bunch of legends. I know like um, Adam Stern, Jared Rosenberg, strength and conditioning coach. And we put together this program basically to get the most of out, out of our bodies and make the most of these opportunities. Sometimes they're only once in a lifetime. You really want to arrive in the best possible condition that you can be. So Spear Ready, 50-day program to help you gear up. Go register newspear.com forward slash Spear Ready. What's the worst thing about going spearing with the dad? Um, well, we're much more prone to arguing with each other. <laughs> <laughs> so even in the Nationals yesterday, we could not make a choice on something. Okay. And I've given him the gun and a blue Merlin swam underneath me while I'm on the four meter rig. <laughs> He's done a dive and it's set in behind him and I'm just like, oh my God. And yeah. So did you give him an air for when he got up? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about working together with someone else too. It's it's sometimes um with your dad, you guys are able to probably have com- conflict. And deal with it, which is great. It's a really good skill to learn as an adult too, how to have conflict and move through things. Um, Because sometimes with people, when you see it with adults too, they don't know how to say what they want to say without causing a fight. But you've got to learn to do it anyway because that's how you make good relationships, I think. So it's good you're learning that. That's another good skill. Um, What do you love about going spearing with your dad? 
Well, we just get along. We work together and we can find the spots. I know he's always got my back. So yeah. when I shoot a fish, he's there. When he shoots a fish, I'm there. Yeah. Conversely, when you go spearing with Bo, is he as good a buddy as your dad? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's awesome dabbing with friends as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I might go over to Bo and ask yeah. him some of the same terrible questions. Um, Bo, have you scared your dad recently apart from that one that he just recounted? Um, not that I can think of really. He doesn't tend to share any of those sort of things. I think he's likes to keep it to himself and when he realises that I'm not actually in any danger, he doesn't really say anything. So I'll let you go. I just let you go in your own merry way and just keep an eye on I think is how it works. <laughs> Bo, uh, something as you become more experienced is you become more aware of some of the risks, yeah? For you, what are some of the biggest risks with spearfishing and how do you mitigate or how do you reduce or manage that risk? Um, some of the biggest risks that I would say would probably the biggest one is shallow water blackouts or just blackouts in general. Yep. I've never blacked out myself but it's – can be a risk. I've heard of people losing their lives doing it and some people getting saved by friends or family, which is good. But, um, yeah, I feel like probably just not pushing yourself too hard and diving with a buddy for sure. Yeah. That can save your life for sure. Cool. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. It's a really good understanding of it. And, it's, yeah, I, I think um, that is probably one of the biggest risks. In coughs... There are a lot of people out accessing the water. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. It's How do you mitigate the risk of not being struck by a boat or um, or a jet ski? Yeah, well, a lot of people say that using floats is good for safety in a lot of different ways. Mm. Boats can see you easier. But a lot of people like to just use real guns without them because the float line can get tangled and caught on different things but I feel like if you're using a real gun if you're under the water and usually you can hear a boat coming always look out make sure that you're in an area that you feel like boats wouldn't really come for you as much don't go spearfishing in a heavy traffic area I think is what yeah. you're saying what about when you're boaty or when someone else is boaty what's one of their jobs when you're under the water with a real gun probably having the dive flag up and keeping boats away from you as well and yeah watching the diver, making sure that they're always got their iron and they don't drift away. And Nice. Yeah. What happens if uh, – do you, Bodie, have you got a uh, – can you get a boat licence? Yep. Yep, yep I've got my boat, boat licence. Okay, so you know how to be a Bodie? Yeah, a okay. Bodie all the time. So what do you do when you're the Bodie and you've got four divers out there, or let's just say three divers, and one guy shoots a fish and he gets separated and the other two sort of seem to be chasing something else in another direction? Um, Walk me through some decision making. Usually if they've shot a fish, I'll try and stay a little bit further away, make sure I'm watching all of the divers at the same time. Yep. And once the diver with the fish gets it in their hands, I'll go over to them and get the fish and make sure I keep my eye on the other divers and yep. let the diver with the fish know where the other ones, where the others are. And, Sick. Yeah. Mate, that's a good understanding of some of the basics. That's really good. Um, it sounds like your dad's doing his job. Yeah, yeah, he does a good job. Yeah. So you, what you were telling me about him earlier may be not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Can you hand the mic to Glenn though? Glenn, for Bo, um, what, what is one of the best things about diving with Bo? And, and your other son as well. Yeah, oh. Your youngest son. It's, it's just watching them, uh, uh, watching them catch the fish for me now. I've, you know, I've sort of been there and done that. And so, you know, I don't, I, I, I get a lot more joy out of seeing them catch something than me catching something. In fact, it's almost, it's almost at the point where it's almost guilt because, I've, you know, I'll go down and I might, if I find a good Jew or, a, or a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great um, tusk fish around or, or whatever it might be, if I go down and shoot that, chances are I've shot a dozen of them before or, mm. or, or more. So, you know, and, and, and maybe they haven't. And, and that's what it's all about. Mm. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just 
that's what's got me. I sort of went, I've, I've never been away from the sport. I've been spearing my whole life and I'll never stop. Um, but I didn't do as much of it probably um, for a period of time until I got them into that six, seven, eight age bracket. And it's like, right, I'm in again. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. What a, what a, what a privilege, eh, getting to bring your boys into it. And generational spearing for you guys too. I, I hope to create a similar legacy. I think it, you, it does require a little bit of strategy, like you've kind of alluded to with a few of the things you've said. I'm going to come back to Bo. Bo, for you, mate, I want to hear about probably one of your most memorable fish to date. And tell the story as well as you can. Don't be too Australian or Kiwi with me. Right. I'll, I'll give you an example of the way culturally people tell stories. And a, an American bloke will tell a story like, oh, yeah, it was like 42 degrees and I dropped down to 29.4 feet and the fish was like, you know, they give the detail. And then the Australian's like, yeah, I dropped down, I shot a fish. So be as open with the story as you can be. Tell me the story. Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> this one, it's I would. It's definitely probably my most memorable fish, but a lot of people would say it's probably also a bit of a scary story, but it wasn't really for me. We were diving the, the classic last year and we, went, we got to this one spot and there was not too many fish around and my brother swam off into this other area and he said he was coming across a lot of fish. So Dad went and picked Corbin and I up and dropped us off and we were swimming around and we had some bull sharks swim past us and we saw a few cobia around. And then a little bit later we were, um, we were just taking a few drops on um, this big school of surgeon fish and then two big bull sharks swam underneath us and I was like, oh, cobia might be on them. So I dropped down and was having a look at the bull sharks and one of them swam <laughs> off that I was having a look at and I turned around and there was these two big bull sharks coming up to have a look at me with a big school of all between 15 and 20 kilo cobia following them. <laughs> Wicked. So um, I shot one of them, one of the cobia, and the bull sharks just disappeared. Oh, good. nice. Well, that's didn't even a good turn outcome. Around. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the bull shark. I've seen the cobia shot, and then the bull sharks annihilate it, and then they. Yeah. So it does go the other way too. Yeah, actually, um, I think what my brother said. He was in the water with me at the time, and he said one of the bull sharks was actually coming up to having to have a look at him at the time. Mm. And as soon as I shot the cobia, it turned and disappeared. So yeah, right. Did yeah. Corbin see that? Yeah, Corbin was just above me as well. Or right, I might get Corbin's angle on the same story. Yeah. So. He's down there and you just see these. You don't really see the bull sharks when, when you're over the top of them. Yeah. But when they turn up, you can just see that white belly. So I'm looking at him and he's just got these two white bellies just appear and start and then you just have the whole school of cobia underneath the bull shark. See. And I was just like, oh, this is going to be cool. So he put a shot in. Did you see him take the shot? Yep. Okay. That's and what shot. happened from there? So How long did it take to subdue it? And He's what? got the spine shot. So it's just... Oh, around. sick. Yeah, so that was not much of a fight. So it was just pulled up. Yeah. Did you guys have a high five Yahoo moment? Yeah. Oh, I love those, eh? It's one of the best things about the buddying up too, eh? Yeah. Do you enjoy watching your your dive buddy shoot fish as much as yeah. shooting them yourself? it's awesome just yeah. seeing someone shoot fish. Yeah. Do you put people on fish? Depends on <laughs> the times. For people who are getting into it, yeah. I really like putting them on fish. Yeah. But... Sometimes it's just like, oh, I haven't shot a fish in a while and that's a really good fish. Tom told me a recent story about that a marlin. marlin. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, I would yeah. love to hear about the marlin, what happened. So <laughs> I'm on the surface and Tom's down and I turn around and there's this big black shape going past Tom and there's a marlin. So he's lined up. And it starts swimming off. So I'm just like, oh, I've seen a video. And it's the Tim McDonald video, the black marlin. He said, if you see a big marlin, you should swim towards it. Of course, as he's swimming, it's like, I saw that Travis Hogan said, never swim towards a marlin. <laughs> but I start swimming after it. And I start swimming after it. Tom's yelled at me from over there. And I was like, oh, man, I shouldn't swim after that marlin. <laughs> yeah. And then the marlin's gone. But he shot a good tusky that day. So I heard, I heard, that, I heard that made up for it. But yeah, I'm a bit annoyed at myself for that one. 
Ah, it's all good. Yeah. Like it's it's live and learn, isn't it? Yeah. I think probably Tim was right. Like you can trigger that compete mechanism and they'll come back on you, like in that video that you saw. But yeah. sometimes I think when there's numbers of divers together in the water in close proximity, you don't trigger that. You just trigger a flight response. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I know with mackerel, the more divers you have in the water, the more spookish they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're diving, uh, if you've got good vis and you're with people you know and you're chasing mackerel, do you space yourselves out a little bit but still buddy each other? So we use Glenn's technique for this. So it's okay. generally best with three divers and then you just have one down all, like all the time you take turns. You go and sit mid-water column, just see what turns up. And with a flasher? Not really with a flasher sometimes. Okay. Of course, flasher works, but sometimes you just get them without. Most mm. of the time. Yeah. Did you guys dive with a flasher yesterday? Sometimes, yeah. Okay. And pre, uh, pre, pre-whaler. <laughs> pre-whaler, yeah. Tell me about the whalers then, Corbin. Oh, so the one we saw yesterday, I didn't see. Dad said it was lining me up. It was big. Yeah, we didn't see many sharks. I was quite surprised. And then um, uh, Corbin just took a shot at a whiting, but it was a – he hit it, but it didn't stick because uh, we obviously didn't have the pranger. And um, probably a couple of minutes after that, that was a very big whaler. Like I haven't seen a whaler that big. We do get a lot of whalers at Coffs Harbour. They're not mm. the duskies, but um, oh, this thing was… Uh, bronzy, uh, eh? Bronzy. Uh, yeah, I think it was a bronzy. Um, it, it was very well fed. <laughs> it yeah. Was, it was very sizable and um, it sort of kept prying from different angles. It didn't sort of just go with… Uh, yeah. I swam towards it. Um and uh, so, yeah, so look, we took a break and got the shark shield out and um, after that we were we were okay, but we did bring the flasher away after that. Yeah. yeah. Our, tr- our flasher um, triggered a bit of a response. Like he came in and had a go at it once and this is only – we were in three metres of water and the shark was two and a half metres long and they are big, fat, well-fed sharks down here by the looks of them. Um and it, like Bert's got this weight on the bottom of my flasher with this material that looks like a squid, but the sharks, for whatever reason, and I've seen it happen multiple times, they hate these things. And so it had a go at it once and then it wasn't enough. It came straight back in and just grabbed it and tore the thing off and Derek and I had to hunt for it in the weed for about five minutes. Um, <laughs> and then Derek's like, maybe we shouldn't use the flasher again. A dive later, I was using the flasher again because yeah, it, it works think, for both. I think it, I think well, it was definitely working when we had the flasher out. You'd get that trail up. That's when we was it the skip. That when we got the skipjack, uh, Travelli. Yeah. The tra- yeah, the skipjacks love them, mate. Yeah, so it seemed to bring it seemed to bring in the fish. Um, mm. Mm. They definitely likes the reflective silver stuff. Yeah. yeah, Corbin hunting in caves is a little bit of a. a there's a heightened level of risk. Like you've obviously got to think about, okay, if I go in there, where am I going to come out? You know, banging your head, entanglement, all of these things you've got to think about when you've got a float line as well. We're going to probably encounter a bit more of the tabletop limestone cave structure and stuff. Is that something you're starting to get comfortable with? Talk me through that if you can. Yeah, so in coughs we do cray diving with our hands and that's not really deep caves. We don't get that structure. You kind of adjust a little bit to getting deep into caves. But here in Rottnest, that's just next level. Mm. So I like just slowly ascending. I've hit my head a few times, but I just go slow so I don't get injured. I really like it. I really like the cave diving. I mm. shot the Jewy yesterday in a cave. That was fun. But shooting a fish in a cave, that can be very painful. Are you using a torch over here as well? I haven't used a torch for the caves. Yeah. I found out yesterday you can. Yeah. I think that probably the go for dark caves. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So you're hoping to shoot some more cave fish up in the next yeah. couple of days of comp? Yeah. And more big swims by the sounds of it. How are the legs today after swimming so much yesterday? They're not horrible. Okay. They're not good. Yeah. But they'll work for next Be- time. Benefits of being young and fit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not broken yet. So the objective will be to burn your dad out good and proper? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how high you can go. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, try, we'll try and get out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for you, memorable fish, most memorable. Probably the mackerel from the beginning of the year. Okay, that was twenty kilos, so oh, yeah. that was bigger than you. Nearly, yeah. yeah. So that was um, a dive we did just a quick morning run, and we dropped in with a guy named Ozzy, and we're just looking for mackerel. So we've gone up north a little bit, and he's done a dive, and I've seen one above him, and 
didn't take a shot while he was down. He's come up and we've chatted about it. So we've moved over to Split and Mike, I've got a new gun. So I'm trying to adjust to it. What um, is it? Uh, Rob Allen Timberline. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that had a eight mil shaft on it at the time. And I had a bit weaker rubbers on there. It works really well with seven and a half mil now, but it was a bit slow at the time. So shot and missed a Sergio, split solitary. And then I've done this another dive over a near sanctuary boy and no Sergio's around. Turned around and I see this mackerel. I thought it was like 10 kilos. So blinded up, shot, and then my reel just starts screaming, screaming. And yeah. That's a cool up. feeling. Yeah, it was awesome. So bit of a toe, bit of a fight. How far did it tow you? What? How far? Like, Through the sanctuary and out the other side. Yeah. A long way. So, a couple of hundred meters. Yeah. 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 They run hard, eh? Yeah. yeah. Really hard. How cool is it being towed through the water? Yeah, it's is awesome. that the first time you've been towed? No, I've been towed a bit. I had this big kingy on a comp one day. Okay. That was a fun time. Yeah. So I that was a real gun on a 110 wetty. Okay. That was went down after a parrot fish with Bo. He's gone up to the surface and I turned around and just had this like I thought it was like 15 kilo kingy. So I lined it up and I was like, oh a real gun. Starts going away and I was like, oh, I'll do it. So I've taken a shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could have done a better shot, but yeah. Got it done. That was a good fish. That was a nice tip. The beauty of um, a yellowtail kingfish versus a Spanish mackerel is the Spanish will run along the surface generally. Yeah. But the, the kingies are filthy fighters sometimes. They just go straight down. They yeah. want to just beat, smash you on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So... Some people really frown on shooting big kingies with a real gun. Why? They'll wreck you. Yeah. They'll, um, so many things can go wrong with a real gun. So mm. like you can jam up and that gun is going to be ripped from your hands and you can have line wrapped around your like, legs and arms really easily. Yeah. I have a thick real line so I can sort of see when it's about to happen. Yeah. But you need to be really careful when shooting big fish with real guns. Yeah. It sounds like you've thought about and made some conscious decisions to shoot that kingy though. Like, because you've said to me, I remember hearing you just say when you said the story, you said, oh, I've got a real gun. Should I, shouldn't I? That's, that's good awareness that you've even sort yeah. of thought consciously about it before just blindly pulling the trigger. Yeah. So the, um, there was another time I was with Bo and I'm over, he's swum over a little bit. I've swum this way a little bit. I've just done this dive laying on the bottom and turn around. There's a big school of big kingies. Mm. And I'm just like, oh, I won't shoot any big ones. So then the small one comes up behind it. I've taken that one. Nice. Yeah. And that was just, yeah, being, making sure it's all safe. Cool. Yeah. And if, if Bo makes the decision to shoot a fish bigger than he should and he's on a real gun, as his buddy, what, do you, what would you do? I've got a belt reel. I, do you have a belt reel? No, he doesn't have a belt reel. So I'd be down there. Trying to get a second shot up, in as yeah, soon as possible. Clipping the belt reel into his gun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. And yeah, second shotting it, killing it as soon as we can. With those big kingies, like, um, do you find that like you, you start to get them within five meters and then they just light up again? Yeah. So it really depends on the shot. Like if you stone them, not can do anything. Yeah. But when you smack them, they'll get to the surface and then they'll just have this second life and they'll just take off. Yeah. So what have you learned about that, particularly with line management and stuff? When you get to the surface, when you get them to the surface, be really careful with the line. Yeah. Because that's when they're going to mess you up. So have you got do you do you do anything else to manage the line? Is there any Um I like just leaving the gun behind me and but I keep a hand on the line, like enough yep. to catch a gun when it flies past. Yep. What was it? Yeah, keep swimming. Yeah. Sweep. Keep yep. swimming so into the current, or yep. if there's no current, just keep swimming. And that way your line sort of feeds out behind you. Yeah, yeah nice. What about tension on the line? Have you have you had it where you've let them have too much tension or you've tried to reef them up too hard? Um, I haven't pulled out a big king. Yep. I haven't really pulled out big fish. I've pulled out reefies from pulling too hard. Mm -mm. If you shoot them, you know you have a good shot, go hard because in coughs our shark problem is getting crazy. Mm. So you, if it's a bad shot, let them run. Because that lets them get away from sharks and everything. Mm. It's a good shot. Let them run a little bit, but then just like chuck. I ain't having them up. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. Sounds like you proper froth on spearing. Is this something you can see yourself doing for your whole life? Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. 
So you're going to be getting your dad out into his 70s as well? Are you going to make him come? Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. We'll see what happens. Hopefully 80. Yeah. Uh, Hardly pulled up after yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Might be just some short overs then. Your dad's taking your brother out. Uh, oh, no, sorry. It, with sub, with sub, subbies and stuff, What what? Are you, are you happy to fatigue your dad? Um, <laughs> If he's still okay the next day, that'd be really good. But it's... Just good getting, making sure he's in the water. It's yeah. really good having a whole family into diving. Yeah, yeah. Makes it easier to fill a boat and also like communication. Yeah, yeah, nice. To make the most of your spearfishing trip charter or competition, I am putting together a 50 day spear ready program so that I can be in the best condition to make the most of this WA comp. It's a big swim comp, shore based, uh, and big swims for the day. I am not carrying a hell of a lot of physical conditioning because just due to my life and lifestyle, pretty busy with four kids. So this program will be 100% focused on action. And I thought since I'm doing it, why not take a whole bunch of other people along for the ride? It's a 50-day program incorporating strength and conditioning, nutrition, dry and pull training, and everything else with a bunch of experts. I reached out to a whole bunch of legends I know, like um, Adam Stern, Jared Rosenberg, strength and conditioning coach. And we put together this program basically to get the most of out, out of our bodies and make the most of these opportunities. Sometimes they're only once in a lifetime. You really want to arrive in the best possible condition that you can be. So Spear Ready, 50-day program to help you gear up. Go register newsfear.com forward slash Spear Ready. As soon as I say anything about freediving safety, I can hear the eye rolls from across the podcast. In fact, you're probably thinking, but Tad, I've never had a problem. I don't push myself. I'm in tune with my body. I know my limits. What is 100% true about that statement is you can always say that statement unless you died from a blackout. You've probably heard of someone in your local waters that died from a blackout and they used to be able to say the same thing and then they blacked out and they died and they can no longer say that. That's the way that argument works. My name is Ted Hardy. I'm the founder of Immersion Freediving and my goal is to do more to stop fatalities from shallow water blackout than any other person on the planet. I never liked the idea that the information on how to not kill yourself while spearfishing was gated behind the paywall of a freediving course. What if there's no instructor within 200 miles? What if you can't afford a course? What if you can't get time off work? So sad, too bad, you just don't get access to the information needed to dive safely? That's why I created freedivingsafety.com. It's a free course that will teach you how to reduce your risk of having a blackout and teach you how to save your buddy's life if they had a blackout. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you can learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I could trust when I pull the trigger. Kill shot spear guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill shot spear guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off. Any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's thirty dollars off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. So over here, Dunsborough versus Coffs. Um, anything you're changing? In your spearfishing, you've got around a little bit now. Yeah. Um, so I find the fish over here a lot dumber. Yeah, right. So in coughs, you really have to work. Like sometimes you get the really dumb fish. Like we get Mary cod. Yep. Those things just sit in front of your spear. You get the dumbest mackerel sometimes. Like they just come and check you out and just sit there. And then there's some kingies, which, yeah. But And, and abalone, are they on the score sheet? <laughs> So here's a funny story with my abalone. <laughs> so on the comp yesterday, I did see a big one. I could not get it off the rock. And Dad was not happy with me trying to catch an abalone. But I've never caught an abalone before and I've lost one. Okay. So I got it <laughs> off the rock and I've lost an abalone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. Oh, just you just dropped it or? No. So I just didn't put my hand in it, put the knife underneath it, oh. flung it to the deepest cave. Yeah. Coughs probably. You know that hemophiliacs? I do not know. So that's why with abs they generally use a tool because if you if you cut them in any way they'll bleed out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when they're not size, you just want to be real careful with them because um, once they separate from if you if you cut them in any way they they bleed out and die. 
So that's why they often have those tools where you break suction but you're not injuring them in any way. Yeah, okay. Um, it's just something to be aware of and I think all the species are the same. Yeah. But they eat really well, eh? You like abalone? I haven't had, I haven't had abalone. Mm. Dad thinks I have but I do not recall it. Oh, last time I was over in New Zealand, I thought you had to tenderize the hell out of them because it was just like eating an old boot if you didn't do it right. But they just whacked it off, cleaned them up, and then chopped them up and did them like wedges, flash fried in a pan with garlic and butter. That's good. Cheap as it's some of the best seafood I've ever eaten. Mm. Mm. Might need to give it a try when I finally catch one. Yeah, well, yeah. day two of the comp. Hopefully we get some more. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully we can find one. I'm I might staring need to your dad up there. Yeah. Yeah. Might even bring the Crayley Pat as well, just in case. Yeah. yeah. Do you like competition spear in Corbin? Is that where it's at for um, you? I'm not the most competitive person. I think I like diving not in comps a lot more. Yeah. I do them. I f- think it's fun just comparing yourself to other people, just seeing what yeah. other people are catching, what they're doing. Like, what I found yesterday was like you have to look through the score sheet if you have any hope. A, because you just want to make – sure you put fish in that you can weigh and stuff like that yeah and but I, i'm kind of with you i think like I, i'm not super competitive particularly with spearing it's not really the way it is for me but i i do like the fact that it forces you to be strategic have a bit of a plan work together yeah. and there's a certain joy in that i think yeah. do, you, do you think the same it's or? a different style of diving it's yep. good. I don't think I could do it 100% of the time. Mm. I wouldn't like to swim 6Ks every time I went diving. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's nice yeah. jumping out the back of a yeah. boat, eh? Yeah, it's like, really you nice jumping out the back of a boat. Yeah. yeah. What boat are you guys diving out of in Coffs? We, Dad has a sea fox. We oh, go out yeah. on other boats, but generally we just use a sea fox. Yeah. Nice. They ride nice too, like a bit of a Haynes style hull, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. you got you got such cool people there, like um, the Thwaites Marine guys, they're awesome. Yeah. Down there. Yeah. yeah, cool. Oh, good. We might come back to Bo and we'll talk yeah. about um, Bo for you. Like um, when you think about the next couple of days of comps, what um, hunting techniques are effective in general in this area? What's what's the style of hunting as opposed to coughs? Is there any difference? Yeah, well, a lot of the fish that you'll get in the comps around here would be more bottom fish. You wouldn't find them sort of mid-water column, mm. whereas in coughs, Oftentimes we only dive to like mid-water, mackerel will come in, kingies, that sort of thing. Mm. But um, yeah, so I feel like it would be more more sort of cave diving and laying on the bottom, seeing what comes in, hanging around, waiting for the harlequin and things to come out. There is a pelagic list on this. It's kingies and sambos. Do you think that that sort of opportunistic fish that you're going to get in between sort of the reef diving do you think you, they, they're just going to happen or are you going to consciously target them? Um, well, I feel like they're the sort of fish that you can't really target as much. You kind of just have to get in the right sort of area and hope that they come in. Yep. They like to swim around a lot more. and Yeah, you've probably more just in between the, the, the cave diving and the bottom diving. Yep, yeah. Yep. Um, we talked about most streamed for species, I think, already, didn't we? Is there anything that was like you'd really love to get while you're over here? Probably a big dewy as well. Yeah? What's yeah. How, how big's big? We saw some big ones coming yesterday in the comp. Yeah, I'd like to get one if I if I had the choice, probably over 10 kilos. Yeah, yeah. They seem like a special fish, eh? Yeah, for sure. It's cool to come to a different part of the world and they, they have iconic species. Like you talk to some of the WA guys and they're not that – like hung up on shooting a big dewey, but if you're from out of state, it seems like it's something that everyone really, really wants to get. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Up north, did you get to shoot a baldy? Uh, um, no, I didn't shoot a baldy. I shot two small deweys, but they were both around the two and a half, three kilo mark. Yeah. So not too big, and I shot, I shot an absolute monster parrotfish, which I've heard you get more bigger ones around this sort of area. Yeah. In coughs, they don't go past five kilos maybe. And they just get eight. shot before they get that big. Yeah. Right? How big was it? 8.2 kilos. Was that a difficult hunt or did you just get lucky? I was looking under – I was in a cave in about five metres of water mm. looking for dewies and it just swam in front of me. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go around the room and ask uh, – we'll do a faster round of questions coming around. We might start with Glenn. Um, dream spearfishing destination. With all the experience you've had, Glenn, I'd love to hear where you'd most like to go in the world. I love New Zealand. 
And I love up around uh, Great Barriers, Chasing Snapper. I reckon that's just, that's me. I really enjoy that stuff. And, and But also, by the same token, stuff like Coral Sea, fantastic. Yep. All right, cool. Bo, for you, dream spearfishing destination? Probably the Coral Sea. I want to shoot a really big dog tooth tuna. And... Sounds like a father-son trip coming up then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Probably same as Glenn. I really want to go to New Zealand, try the hunting more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, seaweed and different species. Nice. Yeah. So some difficult demersal species like yeah. snapper in particular. Yeah. Yep, cool. All right. Andrew? Yeah, look, I, I love the warm, clear water, but um, since – I uh, heard about the Abrolhos Islands, been watching some videos there. I think that would be right at the top of the list. Big yellowfin. Yeah, a bit of everything, isn't it? Yeah. So, it seems Crazy. fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So And very different too. Like I think some of the beauty of spearfishing destinations that are extremely remote areas and, um, yeah, beautiful scenery all on their own. I, I like a bit of a travel with, with the spearing Yeah, as well. you combine it. Yeah. Yeah. There's that big Air Force base over there, I think. Is that the one? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. it's. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I'm thinking of something different. Yeah, the Abrolhos. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm off Geraldton. Yeah, that whole area. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, there's a really good Disney show where they go through and look at the um, mapping of the old wrecks across oh, the yeah. Abrolhos Islands. Oh, um, I know those guys. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so just um, even that, they've got these huge jet boats, obviously, the because they've got quite shallow reefs and um, yep. just the underwater just looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, sea ship hunters or something. It's yeah, something, or something like that. Yeah, Andre um, Redakuda is one of the guys in it, and his him and his mates. Yeah, I've had him on this podcast before. Okay, oh, yeah, great series. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, cool. What's it, can you remember? That is it shipwreck hunters or something? It's close to that. I can't remember. I might have to link it up in the up. show notes. So yeah. Yeah, it'll be cough slads. Uh, C O F F S L A D S, and then um, I'll try and link that show up in there because it's good to give. I think it's really nice if we give exposure to stuff Spiros are doing because they're all Spiros as well. Yeah, they actually um, did some of the only independent testing on the Shark Shield device too. If you ever get to see that, yeah, okay. They, um, they, I think they ended up staying in some fishing cabins, so they had a really good time out there. Like they made most of the weather window. Yeah, Terra Australis is the name of the guys behind that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. All good. Um, we'll come back around again. Another question for all of you guys. Best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Oh, there's so much. I might actually switch that around and, and, and give some advice to people that are listening. Love it. Um, so um, one thing I did have, so this is a few years ago now, um, I just we just got right back into spearfishing and I was diving, I think, with Tom and Ollie Sandstrom. Um, and we're doing some cray diving, nothing. But we'd had a whole day of diving and it started to get difficult to equalise. And then um, I was following Ollie down because he was getting into a cave to do some cray diving um, and I couldn't equalise as I was going down and I, I pushed it um, to get the equalisation so I could follow him. And I ended up bursting an eardrum, um, which I think yeah, there's a few people have done in the past. Um, the thing was it got um, – my, the, the sound in that ear started to decrease over the next few days and I started to get pretty worried about it. But I'd seen, I'd seen the doctor and they said, no, it's just a burst eardrum. Um, the next day it had, I was totally deaf in that ear and so I went down to the local hospital and they said, it's just a burst eardrum. Um, but um, because I was so worried about it, I was doing my Google research and um, uh, sort of self-diagnosed myself and there's a thing called a perilymph fistula which is actually, it's, it's, yes, I had a burst eardrum, but the eardrum heals. But um, it's if you've got too much pressure through the ear, you get a leak in the cochlea. You've got an oval and round window. And that's actually a medical emergency. They can fix it. They have to seal it. Um, otherwise, you, don't, you can really lose all the hearing wow. in that ear. Um, and so that's I, your middle ear. That's your inner ear. Okay. That's your inner ear. So Because when you perforate your eardrum, that's only between your outer and your middle ear. That's right. So that's so, why they didn't diagnose it. They just thought it was the surface level yeah, trauma. Yeah, so, so there's no – I think uh, I had to actually print it out and take it down to the hospital before they took wow. it seriously. Yeah, so that's how hard it was. And the second I did get through to a specialist and they said, yep, so I was straight down to Liverpool Hospital for an operation, but it was getting five days, six days after wow. the event then – and so that can have a really bad outcome. So I did lose a bit of hearing in the ear, but it was nothing. Like I got a lot of it back. Um, cool. So, and it is a big difference. Like you did, obviously, if you're down to one ear, you're not really going to risk that diving again. So 
Oh, I didn't die for a year. or so. It was a long time. Wow. Um, There's a lot to go from it. But I think if I was to try and test it myself, if I'm losing – a perforated eardrum will cause distorted sound, so nothing mm. will sound the same. You'll know that you've you've done it and it'll be, dis- it'll be very uncomfortable. But if you're physically losing hearing in the ear, um, then that's a sign you, you treat it seriously. Um, yeah. Have a look. Yeah, perilymph fistula was was what it was called, cool. and um, it is a medical emergency. So, I think a good lesson for everybody: if you happen to be unfortunate and end up in that position, the best course of advice I'd give is never force an equalization. Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Well, That's a good one. So, same for you, Corbin. Like, best bit of advice you've given, or that you'd like to give others. Uh, this is to beginners. Yep. Uh, this is what I was told when I was getting into it. Find a dive club, find a group of people you really get along with and just try to get into it and have fun. Love it. Like, awesome. Cool. Bo. Probably a bit of both advice I was given and advice for others. I'd say stay calm, try and keep the heart rate low because you'll do your best diving then and you'll, you'll be able to hold your breath for longer and make sure to dive with a buddy as well. Love it. What, just while we're there though, it's some infinite pr- practicalities. What what raises your heart rate and what do you do to lower it? A lot of things can raise your heart rate. Sharks, um, just getting excited over fish. But so, so anxiety, excitement, maybe high expectations of yourself or… Yeah, a lot of those sort yeah. of things. And Because um, you can put pressure on yourself to perform too. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. I feel like probably the best way to just calm yourself down is just to… Breathe and yeah, just not try not to get overly excited or anything. Yeah, yeah, just calm down. Yeah, some people say you can do that cadence breathing. You know, like four seconds in, eight seconds out. Do a few of those, and it seems to get you to come down a little bit. Yeah, okay. I yeah. just try and breathe deeply. I don't really yeah. count. I think just concentrating on your breath. There's something in that too. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Awesome, Glenn. For you, uh, for me, it's it's a little bit of advice my uncle gave me a long time ago, and it was really really simple. And he just said, when you're spearing, think fish. So you've got to get in the fish space, and it's you know it's it that's what it's all about. It's more so than the free diving aspects to me. There's obviously a whole gamut of stuff that you have to be really competent at, but Fundamentally, it it doesn't matter that you can drop down and sit on the bottom for two minutes if you're not putting yourself in the spot where the fish are, yeah. And you don't know how to work them and react when you do see the fish. Mm. And so for me, I focus on that. So when I go out spearing, the first thing you know, when the first thing I do when we when we leave the boat ramp at Coffs and we get to locations is start thinking about where the current's coming from and working out where the fish are likely to be, and it all. It all sort of flows from there, and um, you know, and and you, you just build on that. And and like I said, you know, to me, I think it's if I was going to put numbers on it, it's sort of seven, 60, 70 fish cents, yeah, relative to your free diving capability. Yeah, and yeah, if you can dive really deep, well, fantastic, and you can get you can potentially do really, really well and get a lot more fish. And obviously, the best spearos are the ones that can free dive really well and they have that fish sense to go with it. But, you know, I, I, I rate myself as a really, really average free diver. Um, I don't dive deep. I haven't dived past 20 metres for years and years. I got a long lung squeeze 20 years ago and I simply can't. I do that and, it, and I'm cooked for the rest of the day. But I find plenty of fish. Yeah. And, yeah. and you can find plenty of fish in above 20 metres mm. and, and still have a great time. Someone gave me a lens for this a little while ago and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, the three S's with fish sense. So you think about it from a fish's perspective and you think about sex, shelter and sustenance. So they breed, they need somewhere to be safe and a home if you like generally unless you're talking about pelagic species and then what are they feeding on which is um, sustenance. Do you think about it like that? I'd hear you, I heard you sort of mention them peripherally but for me that was just kind of a, just a simple way sometimes to think about it. Yeah, I think I don't think so much probably about the first one, but the second. I mean, you know, in coughs, um, you know, I've grown up chasing Spanish, and mackerel are all about feeding. And if you don't have uh, put yourself in locations um, where there's opportunity for feed, you're not going to find them. It's as simple as that. 
Um, there are little highways where we can find them, but, you know, we don't, in coughs, we don't fish mackerel with flash as much. We don't burly for them. If you put yourself in that location, um, you're going to find them. And, and I, I use a particular technique with, with mackerel and I don't, I don't swim around. I find where I want to be and if I'm chasing mackerel, I'll put myself in that spot and that's where I sit. And I'll sit there for as long as you like, up and down, up and down. They'll find you. That's what a pelagic fish does. They're moving about. If they're moving about and you're moving about, to me you're reducing your chances of finding the things. One of the things with spearing is you have moments every now and then where everything is alive. Tell me about one of those moments for you, like where you just, you've managed to put yourself on that spot and all you have to do is be still. There's, be still. There's not a lot of hunting to it. It's just, there's just, it's alive. David Attenborough moment, if you like. Tell me about the, the most special one and then we'll go into the last question. Oh, uh, You know what? The, my, one of my most special ones is a really, really simple one. And it was at the end of, the, of um, a competition years ago, the Blue Water Classic, and it was a really, really, really difficult day. It was filthy, dirty water, and I've gone, all right, we're just about back, and if, if I can just get my spell for Spanish here, I'm going to go okay. So we jumped in the water, and my brother and a mate were with me, and they're going, we're not getting in. It was probably three-metre viz, um, but in a spot that I know holds mackerel and is and you could see on the sounder it was full of life. And I just jumped in and just worked it. I just found a location where you couldn't see anything, obviously. But when you were when you hit the bottom, uh, it was just alive and it was really eerie because you could you just seeing flashing all around you. And you're just waiting for a shadow. And I I had I took the time and the patience and eventually probably I I've got a funny little thing in my head where when I'm um, diving for things like mackerel quite often and I put myself in a location, I'll almost count down. I go, rightio, I'm going to have a dozen more dives. And I go, rightio, 12, 11, 10. And I think I got down to the second last dive. And sure enough, a shadow turned up in front of me and, and I ended up doing really well in that comp. So, you know, there's little little simple things like that really. That's what spear fishing is all about to me. Mm. So patience as well is a big thing you touched on there. All right, last question, guys, and it's a big one and it's a tough one. So if you need a pause, do so. Um, What does the spearfishing experience mean to you in one or two sentences? So for me it's changed over the years. Um, One thing that hasn't changed is lifestyle. It's just what a fantastic lifestyle to put yourself in and to be able to get out there and just experience things. Coming with that over the years, mental health, I think it's really, I've used exercise and I've done a hell of a lot of all sorts of um, different types of events and exercise type endurance events over the years, but the one that's never changed again is the spearfishing. And when I get out there and I get in the water, there's nothing else. Mm. That's it. Everything else is gone and it's just me. And then coming to now... um, you know, for a period of time I mentioned earlier, I think I sort of got, I never got out of the spear fishing, but I really hooked into the endurance exercise stuff for a long, long time and that sort of took a took a focus. But as, as soon as the boys came along, now it's all about father-son stuff and mm. getting out there and spending time with the kids. Ripper. Awesome. Both of you. Your dad gave me a book too. It was one to two sentences. but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I was actually going to say probably a pretty similar thing. It's... It's a lifestyle and it's a lot of – it helps with physical and mental health a lot. Yeah. And, yeah, it's – I just love doing it and I'm going to keep doing it for as long as I can. I look around at a lot of young men your age and they are not doing things that are difficult. And I think spearfishing is difficult and it gives you a level of confidence. You'd have to agree with that in everyday life. Do you get that? Yeah, I do agree with that. Quite a lot. It gives you a bit of a challenge in life. Some people don't do much. I used to swim quite a lot, but once I gave that up, I feel like kind of spearfishing was just like one of my main hobbies that I wanted to stick with. Awesome. And yeah, it helped me a lot. So Love it. Awesome, Bo. Corbin? It's a way of life which just drives everything else. Ooh, Your, I like that. Way my, of life that drives everything else. Like my school's definitely changed when I picked up diving. Yeah? 
My grades actually picked up. Yeah. Um, Why? I don't know. I feel like I have more of a motive. Like before spearfishing, I didn't really do anything. I had no motive to do anything. And spearfishing just gave gives you something. Yeah, Which yeah. you can really bond to. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important as a bloke. It's like we, if when you start to feel competent at something, it gives you a level of confidence for everything. And it should do. And I think that's just kind of the way we're wired a little bit. So it's cool to see you guys alive and thriving in this thing. Not that we all of our identity should come from what we're good at, but there's just a certain reality to it, I think. Andrew, your thoughts on it? Yeah, look, I don't really have a lot to to add to what's been said. It's been great hearing what the boys uh, are thinking. But um, look, I, obviously for me it's um, it's a family affair and um, my younger son Brody is, is now getting into it and I think it's a community. Yeah, so I, I, all of my sort of key friends and um, you know, the family relationships and, and where we go on holidays is is all around this community that is the spearfishing group, um, and I, I think that's absolutely fantastic because you're meeting people that are similar interests and lovely um, weirdos. Yeah, that's probably a really good way to say. It. <laughs> um, so, so you know, we're all unique, but um, we all get along, and yeah, we're all driven by sort of similar motives. Um, and uh, look, it is uh, apart from the family and the community thing. Um, it is that one time everyone has the stresses of work and the, all the other stresses that come with, uh, you know, life. Mm. And it, when you're underwater, it does that. You're not going to be able to dive if you can't shut that off. And so it is really the only time um, when I'm there breathing up for a dive or particularly when you're laying on the bottom and it's a bit deeper, not thinking of any of that. Mm. So it's a great break. Mm. All right. Andrew, awesome, mate. Um, you and Glenn are socially... How do I say this? Social networking unavailable, I believe. You guys are... Yeah, not really my thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the young fellas, uh, I want to hear where your Instagrams are. I changed my name a bit too much. Mine's currently Corbin the Outdoorsman. Corbin the Outdoorsman. There's a ring to it. I like yeah, it. Are you going to stick with it or... Uh, it used to be one young, one young spearer. Yeah. And Dad liked that a lot more. But <laughs> I was meant to be getting into hunting and yeah. we had a few injuries along the way. To get into that, so it's been more spearfishing still. Yeah. So, but Corbin the outdoorsman, that's that's got a ring to it. I like it. All right, so people can come follow along with your journey there. Awesome. Bo for you, mate. Mine's Bo George spearfishing. Bo George spearfishing. Yeah, I, there's a ring to that too. Yeah. That sounds like the name of a shop or something. Yeah, I don't really post as much as I should. Yeah. I think I'm probably going to start doing a bit more yeah. soon. Now that I got my GoPro as well, especially. Yeah. Um, Corbin and I actually do have one together. Oh, okay. Did. It's two young Spiros. I'd you I've needed I've been meaning to talk to Corbin about this. Um I'd want to I'd like to get that one back going. If you, you guys wanted. should collab on some videos too. That'd be yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, do that. All right, cool. Um for you guys, particularly um Bo and Corbin, if young people are listening to this like and they want to get into spearing it, can they message you guys? Yeah, for sure. All right, cool. Yeah, um, if you want any advice or anything, feel free to message Corbin or I and we can, if we don't know the answer, we can talk to our dads. Sick. I'm going to link yeah. that up today. It'll be in noobspero.com forward slash coughs lads because I've got four coughs lads in here. And uh, I'll link up the boys, uh, the, the young men's Instagrams and uh, reach out to them if you are interested in the spearfishing life. I'd really love to see more juniors thriving. And what we do, it's such a cool lifestyle as we've all chatted about today. Awesome having you guys on the show. I've really enjoyed having all four of you on here. I think it's uh, something different, but you guys all froth on experience. So it's an, it's an honour and a privilege to have you all on here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If you have a back pain, I reckon this thing is an absolute no-brainer. Check out the Orca Harness at oldmanblue.com.au. The Orca Harness, a diving weight vest made by Old Man Blue. That's right, you can remove the weights and remove the pressure on your lower back and distribute the weight like a boss. It even makes duck diving easier. Store your safety sausage, whistle, mirror and or knife on the Orca Harness and be a safer diver. There's a quick release safety mech. It's 100% Australian made and personally sized. That's right, go and check out the Orca Harness. Make back pain a thing of the past at oldmanblue.com.au. Massive thanks to today's sponsor, Dog and Gun Coffee. 
It's bloody good coffee, ready for adventure. They use specialty grade beans and roasted fresh in Brisbane by a small Aussie team. Their most popular product, and this is one that I love myself, are the preloaded drip filters, which allow you to have cafe quality coffee anywhere. And I use them out on my Strati spearfishing adventures. It is legit cafe quality coffee that you can make with simple boiling water, add your own milk and sugar. Well, that's what I do anyway. Their owners, Sean and Rach, are keen hunters in and out of the water and want to encourage more people to get outdoors. That's pretty much the vision of Dog and Gun Coffee. Check it out at dogandguncoffee.com.au. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. Can't get better than that. Go to dogandguncoffee.com.au. Again, hey, I like the Sandbar Dark Roast as well. Check that out at Dog and Gun Coffee. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Glenn and Bo George and Andrew and Corbin Hart, uh, two legendary father-son duos. And like I said at the start, these guys are really fun uh, just to be around, just to hang out with and chat. So down to earth. Uh, I don't know what it is about guys in that sort of central um, uh, central New South Wales coastline, but just such such cool down to earth people. Honestly, uh, really enjoyed exploring sort of uh, the idea of generational spirit culture today. I hope you did too, uh, guys. If you love the podcast and you want to support it even more, go to patreon.com forward slash noob spiro and sign up and support the show on an episode by episode basis for as little as one dollar an episode. You are directly putting fuel in the Noob Spirit Outboard, keeping the sucker going. And uh, I, I, what I, one thing I did do to thank the uh, the approximately sort of 50 patron legends that support the podcast uh, is there's a four-part breathwork series, including a CO2 table. Uh, so if you are spending some time out of the water, you might enjoy the breathwork tracks. It's just a way to um, stay in touch with your apnea and um, some useful stuff if you're dealing with stress as well. Hey, that's it for me for this week. Uh, next week, it's WA Part 2, Going North with the Old Man Blue. Uh, I'm joined by Bert Calder and Derek Tan again. And uh, I'll tell you what, we got into some mischief on this trip. I'm not going to give it away, but... Uh yeah, we had a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy it. Check that out next week. It's only back in a week too. So rejoin us again. All right. See you, legends. I remember the first time a shark took my Spanish mackerel. The delight of getting close enough to plant a shot mid-body was soon supplanted by the disappointment of a slack rig line as I pulled in my spear gun with nothing to show for it. That moment is captured in every bit of Fuck The Taxman gear, from UV-resistant long-sleeve fish shirts, like Not My First Rodeo jersey, right through to Death and Taxes beach towels. Get amongst it, get amongst it all at fuckthetaxman.com. Tongue-in-cheek gear that only Spiros and fish shows really understand. Right now, get a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more at fuckthetaxman.com. Check it out again, fuckthetaxman.com. Use the code Noob Spiro and get yourself a free hat of your choice when you spend more than a hundred bucks. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions. Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is the shipping going to cost? Great news, the name you can trust is Neptonics. Neptonics, solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics, buy tough gear. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at neptonics.com. Hey, live it, breathe it with today's show sponsor, Adreno. They are the world's largest dive store, and they have an ever-growing range of equipment for frothers just like you. The store is staffed by legends who absolutely live and breathe the spearfishing lifestyle. Check it out, they have hassle-free returns, they've got a price match guarantee in Australia, and always flat rate shipping, and you can even use Afterpay. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Noob Spiro's longest running partner. Massive thanks to them who keep powering the Noob Spiro podcast.